Quaker, and some of you I don't know, but welcome all of you to Quaker House, where I used to work, and this is now the capable hands of Stephen Lynn. While peace is the top priority for Quaker House, and has been for 45 years now, 46, in North Carolina, in the U.S. military, internationally, questions of Racial justice and struggle are intertwined with all of that. So it's perfectly appropriate to be talking about some of that, some related to that tonight. And before I came to Quaker House, I had some act active involvement in some of that, and most active was 50 years ago in Selma, Alabama. Very, very junior member of Dr. King's staff. It's a true statement to say I was a member of Dr. King's staff. I have a little ID card somewhere that sort of proved it. But to put that in perspective, Fort Bragg near here, you have generals and you have privates. And it's a reasonably accurate statement to say that the privates in the 82nd Airborne Division are on the staff of the commanding general. And that was sort of, well, even though we are. Uh, Nonviolent army was very much smaller than that. We had a general, Dr. King, and I was a private. So there was, in my experience with Dr. King, I was in Selma for about a year. There were, in my observation, there were like three concentric circles of people around Dr. King. The smallest circle, the closest circle, with people in his family and his very close colleagues and companions, Ralph Abernathy, Andrew Young, Jose Williams, and then there were some other people who were less well known, a fellow named Stanley Levison who lived in New York and had no real public visibility at all, but King's most, most close collaborators and advisors for a long time. Anyway, those people, when those people talked about Dr. King, they called him Martin. And you can see why. They had enough contact regularly to be pretty familiar with it. Then there was a second, second circle, larger than that, of people who had occasional contact with Dr. King. But when they were talking to other people, I think they had an inclination to uh, magnify or maybe even a exaggerate their contact with Dr. King. And they often talked about Dr. King as Martin when they were talking to people outside their circle. Then the third circle was probably everybody else. And for everybody else, pretty much, he was Dr. King. And even though I was on his staff, as I say, it was a true statement to say that, I was always in the third circle. Even though I did get to spend the night in jail with him, I'll say a little bit about that later. Um, he did not seek my advice about that that we were doing. I was not in charge of anything. Nonetheless, I was a professional civil rights worker. They paid me all of $25 a week. So, anyway, it's a long story about how I got to be on his staff, and I'm not going to tell you because you don't have all night, but it is summarized in my book here called Eating Dr. King's Dinner, which is available. And um, um, one, the only thing I will say about it is that there was a profile, pretty well established profile, for young white people in the civil rights movement in those years when I was there. And the thing about it is that I didn't fit it. For one thing, I didn't go to an elite college, and most of the white kids in the movement went to pretty high-level schools. I went to Colorado State University. I'm not ashamed of that. Um, but it was not an elite school. Then, I, I wasn't Jewish. I wasn't a Unitarian. I wasn't even a Quaker. I'm a Quaker now, but I wasn't then. I was raised Catholic. 
and those th those three affiliations showed up a lot when I mean, young white people got in the movement. And then also, my parents were not, well, before I get my parents, I was also not what they call, if you read some of the histories, I was not a red diaper baby. My parents were not lefties or old liberals from uh, World War II or whatever. They were kind of uh, apolitical folks who sort of lean conservative, came out of a little farm town in Kansas. They both ended up late in life as being much more conservative, but they didn't teach me a bunch of right-wing stuff. So I, was, I, I just, didn't, but I didn't have any of those associations that, if you read the histories, you'll see lots of people grew up singing Woody Guthrie songs, you know, and uh, uh, believing in Lead Belly and Paul Robeson and all that. I mean, that's all wonderful, but I didn't know anything about it. Nothing. Nonetheless, I did end up. Very junior member of Dr. King's staff, and went to work for him in Atlanta at his office. And they, I, one of the ways I really kind of the way it happened was I wrote letters to all the groups, civil rights groups. I wish I had a copy of that letter as an object lesson in humility because I don't remember exactly what it said, but I know what the, what the message was, and the message was. Here I am, just what you need, another clueless white kid from the north. <laughs> and uh, really, it must have been uh, what we call divine intervention for, for Quakers, that uh, anybody took that at all seriously. But I also said I was a writer. And there was truth to that statement, except the truth was mostly in the future. <laughs> and I, they actually hired me to do some writing for them, which I was completely unable to do. I was just total failure as a writer. So it turned out that the flip side of only paying me $25 a week was that their uh, labor productivity expectations were not so terribly high. Because if they had been, they probably would have fired me in a couple of weeks because I just was not able to translate what I learned and experienced there into writing for many months later. Actually, uh, I will say one little example about that. When I, when I did go to work for them in Atlanta, one of the first things they asked, told me to do was to undertake a series of interviews with Dr. King's executive staff people, like Andrew Young, Ralph Abernathy, Jose Williams, because, they told me, a reporter from Ebony Magazine was coming to Atlanta, and they were planning to do a big article, probably a cover story, on the topic, the men around Dr. King, talking about his inner circle folks that we could call him Martin. And they wanted me to go interview all these people, sort of a pre-interview process, and prepare kind of summaries that could be given to the reporter to help the reporter's work proceed. Well, that was fine. I was, oh, sure. Turn me loose. And the first of the men around Dr. King that they sent me to interview was a woman. Remember, this is pre-women's movement, okay? Mm -hmm. And Dr. King and his folk, his circle, for all their many virtues and their historic importance, they were a bunch of male chauvinist pigs and no mistake, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and, but they did have, actually, two women on his executive staff. And the one that they sent me to see first was a woman named Septima Clark. And if it, has anybody heard of Septima Clark? Yes, yes, yes. I see a hands waving in there. Got to be Hennessy's over there. <laughs> You're right. Well, Septima Clark was from Charleston, South Carolina, and she had been with the NACP, gosh, in its first decade, I think, around 1910, 1915, when it was a dangerous undertaking. She was a school teacher. I think she lost her job, and had a lot of had had a lot of experience. And she actually organized and ran a program that they called citizenship, edu citizenship Education, where they would come to small towns, imagine small towns around here, where you had a lot of uh, people of color who were still working on plantations, and most of them were still illiterate, or essentially illiterate. And she would train local folks to teach literacy, but she would teach literacy with two particular kinds of materials that really stood out. 
One, she would teach them literacy using the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And told about the experience of, if you can imagine these folks coming off of a hard day's work in the field. We're talking adults, not, not necessarily kids. And sitting down, say what? Pardon my stumbling imitation of the country person's accent. Y'all trying to tell me I got the right to vote? Mm -hmm. I want to say that that was more than literacy education. Mm -hmm. That was very, very subversive, really. Similarly, for numbers, numeracy, they would teach them how to operate a basic bank account. This wasn't the days, of course, when you didn't need an act of Congress to go open a bank account. And many of these folks who worked on plantations were entitled to shares of various government price support programs for agricultural crops, and they would get checks once a year. But of course they couldn't read the checks, and they couldn't tell what was on them. Mm -hmm. And the boss man would bring them the checks on like a clipboard, turned up with the back on top, and they'd say, John, okay, here's your check. And we're talking plantations <coughs> where they had company stores. You bought your groceries and stuff from the store, mm -hmm. and they kept it all in a in a book, you know, some kind of a book that you didn't get to look at and you couldn't read anyway. And they say, well, John, uh, let's see, your check here is uh, for $120. And, uh, well, let's see here, in the book, yeah, well, you owe the store $119, uh, so here's your change. And put your X on the back of the check. Well, she, she and her program taught these folks how to read numbers and how to operate a bank account so they could deposit money and take money out. And so that they could say, when they got the gumption, as well as the skill, excuse me, sir, I'd like to see this check, turn it over, it says here $250. You said only $119. Oh, that makes a difference there. So both of these kinds of things were subversive and potentially liberating, but it was very small scale. Very low key, quiet. It would be mostly happen in churches, and um, they had foundation money. Anyway, so she was really some something. She also was a person of great gravitas, not stuffy, and yet serious and sober and kind of no nonsense. So anyway, she was the first on my list, and I went into her little office and. Dr. King's office complex, and sat down, she was behind a desk. I remember she had little kind of earrings, maybe like a little rose, um, gray hair. And I had a little notebook, and I had a pen, you know. Well, Mrs. Clark, great to talk to you. Uh, tell me about yourself. And she sort of leaned back, you know. And she said, the first thing she said was, well, my father was a slave. And that's all I remember. Because it was like a slot opened up in the ceiling and a, a sandbag came down and knocked me on the head. I mean, I practically fell out of the chair because, I, it's not an exaggeration to say I was a clueless white kid from the north. I really had had no experience with any kind of lived reality past or present of the, of the realities of the American racial situation. I was raised in a military family, Air Force, which was technically desegregated, one of the most desegregated institutions in our society at the time. The Lord knows it was pretty far from equality, but on the other hand, it could have been a lot worse. And so I just didn't have that kind of experience. Plus, I was new to the South, and uh, segregation was a word on a page and suddenly be sitting there. And, and she didn't say it, you know, it was just a fact. It was not, uh, any, not any big emotion thing to it, but I was just floored. And I went home to my little apartment that night and sat down at my little typewriter, and all I could write was a poem. It was called On Meeting Mrs. Septima P. Clark. It was actually published later. But it never did Dr. King's organization any good. <laughs> and uh, in fact, I'd only been there another couple of days, and I learned this was in December of 2000.
two, uh, excuse me, 1964, and Dr. King was on his way to uh, Europe to get the, to collect the Nobel Peace Prize. In fact, that was when I first, I first met him when he was coming in to shake everybody's hand to go get on a plane and fly off to Oslo or wherever it was. And um, he came in. That's when I met him. How do you do, How do you do, Joker? And my first visual impression of Dr. King. <coughs> was, oh my God, he's shorter than me. Because <laughs> you, you think of him as being, you know, larger than I did. You know? And he was in lots of ways. But So, anyway, I heard that they were planning to come to Alabama. They, they talked about it as the Alabama Project. And as soon as I heard about it, I was crazy to go. I mean, I was just wild to get there. Because even though it was a thrill and an honor to be working in Dr. King's office. It was still working in an office. And although I have my own little office at home where I write stuff, working in an office and me just really was not a natural mix. So I just, look, I want to get out. They call it in the field. And the older veteran workers who met me and said, oh, well, yeah, you got to get out there and pay some dues. Pay your dues if you want to see the woods. And I said, yeah, okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. So anyway, January 2nd, who's seen the movie? Selma the movie? Most, well, in uh, early on in the movie, they have a scene where Dr. King is in the car with several of his colleagues, and they're driving into Alabama, and they're talking about how scary it is and all that. There were actually two cars, and I was in the second. So I got there at the same time he did really for the campaign. It was January 2nd, 1965. And I was there for a year. And I told him, again, uh, let me go to Selma with the project and here's what I can do. Every late after, every afternoon I can come into the little office they were borrowing and I'll write up a summary of what's happened that day. And I'll get on the phone to Atlanta. Call it in, dictate it to somebody there, and you can use it to talk to reporters with. Fax machines did exist then, as I recall, but they were rare and expensive and we didn't have them. So they said, all right. And I did that for a couple of days. And then I think maybe the third day, sat down at a typewriter. And again, I, I started writing a sentence or so, and then it wasn't exactly like a sandbag coming and knocked me over, but I just sort of came to a stop. And, looked at the page and had this realization again that I really have no idea what's going on here. Even though I'm here, I don't understand the South, I don't understand Alabama, I don't understand Selma, I don't understand segregation, I don't understand the Black Belt. And I can fake it, but I can't fake it. I'm not I just don't I'm not able to do this. So I didn't do it anymore. Again, saved by twenty-five dollar relatively low job performance expectations. They let me wander around after tra tracking along after some of the more veteran organizers, a fellow named James Orange, big James Orange, and uh, just sort of see what he was doing and try to learn things. And by a couple of weeks, after a couple of weeks, there were people who came down to the north. There was a steady trickle, st a steady trickle of folks coming from the north to visit and see what was going on. A lot of them were ministers and stuff. And we had kind of a uniform there, which was overalls and kind of a, uh, a Levi blue jean jacket. That was, a, I guess, I mean, I didn't start that. I just went and got some because that's what the others were wearing. And I guess it was to be kind of identified with folks who were basically still mostly agricultural in their orientation. So I had my overalls on, and they weren't quite brand spanking new anymore. And I can remember, within a couple of weeks, some fella comes from Massachusetts or Connecticut or someplace, and he sees me wandering around town in my overalls and figures out, oh, oh yes, you must be a veteran here. What are you doing? And I got into the habit of just saying to people, I'm going to school. <laughs> I'm doing. I'm just trying to learn, trying to find my way here. And uh, so I didn't really have any great 
personal accomplishments, other than maybe surviving, but I, I learned a great deal. And it wasn't until the next fall, uh, October, November, I'm not sure exactly when, that I was actually able to write something in prose. I wrote several poems, which two or three of them were published in one place or another. I didn't necessarily show them to my colleagues in the movement particularly, because it wasn't what I was assigned to do, but nonetheless, it was all that come out of me. So, um, nonetheless, I was able to do a few things. And one of the first actual tasks, other than trying and failing to write, was to be J James Orange and a couple other people, uh, along with me, were assigned when we had marches in town, and Dr. King was there, several of us were assigned to walk around him. We were his bodyguards. We had no weapons. And in fact, when we were assigned to do this, I remember saying to James Oren, big James Oren, Jim, what, uh, what are we supposed to do? Uh, can you walk around our kids? Why are we doing that? He said, it's simple. We're supposed to block the aim of anybody who's up on the rooftops with a high-powered rifle. Selma didn't have, a, didn't have high, uh, real high buildings. There were three, maybe four stories. But Jim, what if somebody's up there? <laughs> and, and he squeezes a trigger. And he gets at me instead. And I remember. He just laughed and slapped me on the back. He said, don't worry about it, Chuck. I promise, if you get shot, Dr. King will preach at your funeral. <laughs> well, thanks, Jim. It makes me feel so much better. And I actually did that a few times. Now, walking along is something I could manage. Fortunately, they didn't ask me to walk and chew gum. At the same time, I'm not sure I could handle that. But um, I did actually did that several times. And later, several years later, when I came back to Selma and, and uh, was doing research for this, for my first book about the movement, published in 1974, reading all kinds of newspaper accounts and other materials, I discovered somewhere, it's mentioned in a footnote somewhere, that there was at least one occasion when authorities were pretty sure there was somebody up on the roof. And that that's made the hair stand up on the back of my neck, but, but it didn't really surprise me then, because even in Selma, I had been shown some of the hate mail with Dr. King. I mean, he got death threats practically every day. And you got to figure that most of them were just, you know, people talking. But if even 1% were real, if you get a death threat every day, that's 365 in a year. And if only 1% of it was real, that's three and a half real ones in the course of the year. And if you say 2% or 3%, if it was 3%, that'd be one real one every month. And there was a, another occasion, I don't know whether I remembered this at the time, but I found it in research. Dr. King left Selma and went to Los Angeles while the movement was still going on to give a big speech somewhere, and I'm sure they gave him some money that went into the movement. And when he got to, when he got to L.A., the L.A. cops raided the house of some fellow who'd been making threats and went into his garage and they found a big cache of weapons. And, and so this guy was evidently pretty serious about it. That, that, that was no surprise. I mean, it didn't happen every day, but it was no surprise. So, just parenthetically, this experience left me feeling, if any of you read biographies and stuff, you know that there are people who have floated a variety of kind of conspiracy theories about Dr. King's murder beyond what the official story is, and I have kind of a rule of thumb based on my own experience that I believe them all, even the ones that contradict each other, because it seems clear that there were a significant number of plots to kill Dr. King, and one of them finally succeeded. And the idea that they're all wound together in one grand plan run by whoever, the CIA or you're talking about it, that's way too simple for me. There were a lot of people who wanted to see Dr. King dead, and somebody finally succeeded. It could have been one of a significant number of, of aspirants to that achievement. So anyway, there was some pretty frightening moments, and on, 
I was arrested there three times. First time was in the middle of January. Maybe I can. Uh, let's see if we can make this thing move a little bit. Let me stop for a, uh, a parenthesis. Those who've seen the movie, here you see the reality versus the movie. You know they had a lot. They mixed history with artistry and whatever. Well, in this down here, this is what you see in the movie. Okay, Selma City Council, welcome to Selma. Well, that picture was taken in 1966. That's the real thing there. Selma National Bank, welcome to Selma. Well, Selma <laughs> National Bank is long gone. Wells Fargo, all the local little banks. Remember, remember local little banks? Yeah. Yeah, I opened an account at the Alexandria Bank of Northern Virginia in 1979 or something like that. And I still have that account. Now it's Wells Fargo. I never moved. I never moved. No. So, uh, but they changed it. Why? I don't know. They had reasons. Probably, maybe somebody still owned a trademark and wanted them to pay a fee, and they didn't want to pay a fee. So uh, I'm not going to dwell much on the movie right now, but I just want to mention that. And I owe this next picture. If you look uh, just to the left, you can't see it. Just barely in the on the screen is Jose Williams. There, this is a day when they were announcing that the, the plan to march from Selma Montgomery was actually going to happen. They had been talking about marching from Selma Montgomery for instance before they got to Selma, but the actual tactics of the campaign were kind of ad hoc. You know, we, we have a lot of ideas. What we're actually going to do this next week depends on what happens this week. And there was a lot of factors. So. The, a fellow named Jimmy Lee Jackson got shot, and a few days later he died, and that crystallized the, the energy within the movement and the community. By golly, we are going to march to, to Montgomery, and we've had enough of it. So, they were announcing this, and there's a fellow in the second row that I don't know with a little cowboy hat on, straw hat on, and then there's John Lewis there, and then there's a couple of fellows in the back, I don't know them. And then Andrew Young was there, and then that's me. And I owe this image to the sharp eyes and unstoppable research dedication of Professor Roderick Lewis back there. He found it. So this was actually part of the. He found it about two months ago, and I have to say, I was very grateful to him for that because. Um, all, I was there for a year, and I don't have any pictures of me Aww. there. And so, was I making it all up? You know, now <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're now members of a very exclusive club. You've seen a picture of me with no beard. <laughs> beard now. But just to back that up, there's my mug shot from the first <laughs> time I got arrested in the middle of January, and uh, the state of Alabama put together a big booklet, or actually a big book, two volumes of it, of uh, individuals involved in civil disturbances. And Dr. King's picture was the very first one in, in the book. But then they had all these folks. It's funny, I've run into a couple of people that I met much later. And then a, a number of the people I worked with. So anyway, I was arrested in the middle of January, just basically in, a, in a March. I was only in for a few hours. Then on the 1st of February, I was arrested with Dr. King and about 350 other people, and I was in actually overnight. And probably I should tell you a little bit about that, because that's, from that comes the title of this book here, Eating Dr. King's Dinner. They took us, it was February 1st, it was a Monday morning, we were marching, aiming to march to the county courthouse, which is downtown, and um, but we did so by just by walking down the middle of the street. And this was all according to plan. The, Dr. King and his circle, of which I was not a part, had decided it was time for him to get arrested, sort of heat things up some. And the way to do that was to walk down the middle of the street. Because in Selma, if you, if you want to walk, walk downtown and protest something, you can do that and walk on a sidewalk. And that's what we had done before that. And that was fine. That was legal. 
But to walk down the middle of the street, that made you a parade, and you had to have a permit. <laughs> we didn't have a permit. So that put the city. There was tension between the city police, headed by the public safety director, a guy named Wilson Baker. Yeah. The fellow in the white raincoat, that's Wilson Baker. It's interesting. He was the chief of police, but he didn't call himself chief of police. He was called the public safety director. And as you can see, he wore a suit. He didn't wear a uniform. That was intentional to distinguish him from the sheriff, mean guy Jim Clark, who liked to beat up people. He, he, he had a variety of uniforms, one of which made him look like somebody who was trying to look like General Patton out of World War II. He served in World War II. Clark served in World War II. And he was a mean guy. He liked to beat up people, liked to beat up black people. So they were very nervous about getting arrested by Jim Clark. And there had been struggle between the mayor who hired Wilson Baker to be public safety director and Jim Clark, who was the sheriff of the county, over jurisdiction. And the city people, uh, Wilson Baker was new in his job, and the mayor that hired him was new. They wanted to assert jurisdictional control over the city, which they were able to do, in, and over Jim Clark's protest. But Clark said, aha, okay, so you have jurisdiction over the city, but I have jurisdiction over the county courthouse, which is right in the middle of downtown. And that's where you have to go to register to vote. So they had headed for the courthouse. We were going to be passing through the city's jurisdiction and ending up with the county jurisdiction. And marched down the, the middle of the street to make sure that the city would have to arrest us. And Wilson Baker wanted to arrest us that, rather than have Jim Clark do it because he was resolved to do so quietly. He was a very smart segregationist. He, he knew there had been a movement in Albany, Georgia, where the police chief there, a guy named Laurie Pritchett, had worked very hard when the movement came and protests came. He arrested people very quietly. Where there was no, he did not allow his police to beat him up in sight of any cameras anyway. And people would just be carried off very sort of calmly. And this squelched the movement because there were out of town reporters coming to cover a, a riot. And there wasn't any riot, there wasn't any violence. And they got bored and moved on. And Wilson Baker knew, that, knew about that, he had studied that. And that was his approach. He wanted to basically run Dr. King out of town by dealing with him in a very calm and outwardly professional manner so that the news people would get bored and go away and the movement would fizzle and Dr. King would go somewhere else. And it was a very plausible plan. But because of the tension between Wilson Baker and Jim Clark, who loved to beat up people and didn't care, there was this tension. It was a good cop, bad cop thing, which made the story much more interesting, really. And so we were arrested by Wilson Baker, and he took us upstairs. It turns out that for some reason, the county jail was on the third floor of the city hall, um, which was only three stories high anyway. So we wound up on the third floor of, this, of the city hall in the county jail. It was a big room, a day room with, with cells along one, one side, and then we were all, the men were all in this room, and then there was a steel wall, and then the women were on the other side. We could hear them, but we couldn't see them, of course. And we were there for a few hours, and Dr. King was there, uh, but he said he was tired, he had a sore throat, he didn't want to preach. So um, he said, well, let, let's have a Quaker-type meeting. People just speak as a sort of <coughs> moose. That was my first exposure to a Quaker meeting, ever. I didn't know anything about Quaker. I have to say, I've been to hundreds of Quaker meetings since then. And I never went to one that was anything like what we did in that, in that uh, jail. Because, we, you know, singing and clapping and stomping. Uh, the steel wall over the corner was like a, the one, folks who were up against that steel wall, we were clapping and preaching the freedom song, they'd be pounding on the steel wall in rhythm and stuff. And it was, mm -hmm. people were preaching and praying. And it was really something, just really, really something. But it finally, finally, calmed down after a couple hours, and um, we were still there, and then the door, we heard the door clanging <coughs> at the end, and sure enough, Sheriff Jim Clark sticks his head in, and he starts looking around, you, 
Dr. King, over here. You, Ralph Abernathy, over here. You, no, that's the right there, over here. And then he pointed at me. Cool. You, over here. All of a sudden, I was very nervous. <laughs> because we heard stories about people being taken out of jail cells and uh -huh. beat the tar out of them. And what, was he, what did he have in mind? What was going on? And it looked like he was trying to take the, the leadership and the professional agitators away from the men to make them more easy to control. And it was a big, big stretch to include me in that number, <laughs> except for the fact that they were, I mean, I did get a paycheck, $25 a week, whether I needed it or not. I did have a little ID card, so I was a paid, and I was from outside, that's for sure. And I was trying to learn how to be an agitator. <laughs> but like I say, it felt like a stretch. What am I doing in this company? But anyway, they took us out, downstairs, one floor, into, um, let's see, yes, into what turned out to be the city jail, which was much, much smaller. In fact, there was really, all I ever saw was one cell block. And that's it, right there. We were, I was able to go back this last fall, and they showed me, they still had it, they have not not really using it, but it was in, uh, probably just this cell right here, you see the, the blue patch, that's a, that's a ratty old uh, kind of mattress. There were four bunks, steel bunks. And we got in there and, and I was able to see something that, it was see something, Dr. King knew something that very few people ever got to see him do, namely take a nap. Once we got in there and Jim Clark went away, I guess we were transferred to city jurisdiction. And uh, we got us down there, he left us alone. And as soon as it was clear that nothing bad was going to happen, Dr. King laid down and went right to sleep. Mm -hmm. So, I couldn't sleep. It was, by then it was the middle of the afternoon, and we had started out from the church in the morning, and when they arrested us, they put us, they herded us into the, the parking lot behind City Hall and left us there for two hours. And by the way, did I mention this was February 1st? It was freezing. It, it, you know, it's not Minnesota. But it was cold, and they were hoping that people would go home. Maybe a few people did, but most of us didn't. So, anyway, and so it's by now, it's the middle of the afternoon, and Dr. King's asleep. Other people are just sitting quietly. I'm sitting quietly, and I began to notice something. I hadn't had anything to eat all day. When I got up that morning, I was way too keyed up to eat anything. I got to the church and get down with it. No breakfast. They hadn't brought us anything in the jail downstairs, or upstairs. And here we were, the shadows were starting to get long. There were just little teeny windows, but you could see uh, late in the afternoon. I'm hungry. And when you're sitting in jail with nothing else to do, they're not beating up on you or something, your main adversary is boredom and tedium. And in a situation like that, stuff like rumbling in your stomach gets to be louder, and you feel it more because you got less to distract you from it. I was starving. Anyway, time passed, it seemed like days, and then pretty soon, finally, um, I heard some noise out in the hallway, squeaking a kind of wheels and, and country voice. Dr. King, I got dinner for Dr. King. And I looked through the bars, two bars. That's my jailhouse selfie. <laughs> And I saw a fellow coming down the hallway, dressed in whites like the, the kitchen, oh, pushing a little cart, and on this cart was one plate, and it was piled high with steaming, freshly cooked collard greens. And I mentioned, I think, that I was new to the South. <laughs> <laughs> and my initial encounters with collard greens, which I was... They had not gone well. <laughs> I didn't like the smell. I didn't like the look. I didn't like the taste. And now there I was, looking out these uh, bars, and coming down the hall was one plate. And uh, those of you who go to church, some some churches they they think conversions happen slowly. But <laughs> other churches they want to. And I have to say, I underwent an instantaneous conversion <laughs> to a total believer in color. <laughs> Look through those bars. They smell so good.
<laughs> and they look wonderful. But as appealing as they look, I found myself. You know that we're, we're, we're like an army here, and there's only one fleet. And in the army, I don't know much about the military. Really? Not then. Maybe not now. But you, you figure, um, for if you're going to win the battles, if you're going to win your battles, your generals got to be able to give good commands and make good decisions. And to make good decisions and give good commands, they're going to need, you know, they have to have their nourishment. And so, maybe if this looks like it's the way it's got to be, it's one plate there. And you say, oh, Dr. King. And Dr. King actually got up when he heard this and came over to the bars and looked through and then he started talking to the guy, but I, I wasn't paying any attention. All I could see and all I could take in was this place. I mean, I, in my, I still see it in my memory and it seemed like it was getting bigger. <laughs> it really wasn't. And, um, but I thought, well, okay, if this is the way it's got to be, Dr. King needs his nourishment so he can make good decisions so the movement can be a success. He's a general, I'm a private, uh, I'm young, supposedly healthy, and you know what they say, war is hell, so uh, if i got to go hungry, that's the brakes. And I was just pondering all of this and tasted again, taking in the aroma. When Dr. King finally, I, I, I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't listening to what he was saying, and then, but then he said, I, I can't eat your grains. Say what? <laughs> Which is what the guy pushing the green, the table, or the little cart said. He was, uh, I figure he was a trustee, probably a city jail prisoner, who they let work in the kitchen. And, and that's what he said. Say what? And then Dr. King started uh, telling him, giving him a, well, a talk. He started talking, explaining. And what he said, this is not his exact words, but I remember it well, in the gist of it. He talked about how not long after the first movement he was involved in, the Montgomery Bus Boycott, was concluded. Some folks, including Quakers, raised some money, and they sent him and Ralph Abernathy to <coughs> for several weeks to study the work of Mahatma Gandhi, who wanted the British to go away and let India be a free country. And they had a good time there, learned a lot, and said, that one of the things they found out was that the British arrested Gandhi and, and his followers a lot, and he spent a lot of time in jail during these various years of struggle. And this got to be a familiar enough experience that Gandhi actually organized a whole routine. And he, he would explain to people when he got arrested with a bunch of his followers, he said, look, the British think that because they've got us behind these bars, we are out of commission and the movement's in trouble. But they're wrong, and we're going to show them they're wrong, because we're going to make this time count. And we're going to make it count towards the freedom struggle. And here's how we're going to do it. A lot of ways, actually, but the important ways are, some of us here are illiterate. So we're going to have class, and those who can read are going to be teaching people who can't read about how to read. Also, we have people here who have crafts, who have professions. You don't have your tools, you've got a dirt floor, you're going to give us some classes. We're going to talk about what you do. You can draw pictures in the dirt, explain stuff. We're going to educate each other about who we are and what we're doing. Plus, if we're going to be a free country, we got to be able to govern ourselves. So we're going to have parliament, and we're going to practice parliamentary procedure and motions and debate and yada, yada, yada. And we're going to get experience with that. And then in addition to that, the British, by the way, this is, this is not my lecture about Gandhi. This is what Dr. King was saying, okay? And I'm standing there because it's all news to me. And so, the British, among other tactics, were trying to divide the Indian people. Because there's lots of religions in India, but the two biggest ones is Islam and, and Hinduism. And they were helping sow dissension between the Hindus and the Muslims, and they were doing a very good job of it. There were riots and killings and all that sort of stuff. And so Gandhi was working very hard to keep the Hindus and the Muslims to be friendly with each other. So they had worship services. Religious service. They'd read from the Quran. They'd have Hindu prayers and they'd talk about the religions, try to get people comfortable with each other, not trying to convert anybody. Well, Dr. King was going on and on about this. So he said, Well, 
When we came back, Abernathy and I talked about this, what we'd seen, what we'd heard, what we'd learned, and we got to thinking, you know, when we get back to the States, we're going to be working against racism and segregation and stuff. We're probably going to end up in jail ourselves, probably more than once. So how, do we, how can we adapt what we've learned here in India to make the time that we've got to spend in jail count for our struggle there? Well, we worked at it, and we, we worked up a whole plan. We worked up a whole plan. And the idea is to make time in jail, particularly if the two of us, and we try to get arrested together, make it into kind of a retreat time. Uh, a kind of a spiritual retreat. Time of reflection. And renewal. And to get ourselves in the proper frame of mind for this sort of experience, can you guess where I'm going with this? <laughs> for the first two days that we're in jail, we fast. And that, sir, is what I can't get your grades. I looked at him. You ain't gonna eat my greens. I don't think you can give a hoot who Gandhi was or what Gandhi did. And he reminded me, standing there, he reminded me of like the story about the little drummer boy, Christmas time, who all he knew how to do was play the drum, and there he is, uh, approaching the manger in the stable, and he wants to give a gift to the new baby. And what's he got? And all he's got is his drums. Well, here was this spot, this guy in a little white kitchen suit, and you got to figure, I mean, I don't, I don't I didn't know him, but I think there were some educated guesses you could be made. Probably he was in jail a lot. After, among other things, unemployment among black males was real high around Selma. And probably he was in jail a lot, but probably he was not a violent person. He probably didn't kill anybody or rape anybody. He let him work in the kitchen after all, where he got knives. So he was probably not a dangerous type criminal. And probably also, he didn't have much to look forward to. I mean, there he is. Best he could do was work in the kitchen in the jail. Um, and then into this pretty bleak life or situation, in comes Martin Luther King Jr. Just got the Nobel Peace Prize. Moses. I mean, Dr. King was. It's hard to just. Oh, it's hard to exaggerate in how highly esteemed he was by a lot of people. Then, um, so there he is in his jail. And so he decides he wants to bring him a present. And what can he do? He can cook greens. So he makes them up, brings them to the plate, presents it to him. The guy gives him a lecture about some bimbo named Gandhi. <laughs> and won't you? Well, those of you who are church or churchgoers you may also know about the parable of the Good Samaritan, about how a guy gets beat up and left dead by the side of the road, and various people go past him and won't stop. And then the Samaritan comes along and sees him, and in the text it says, his heart was moved with compassion. And I'm standing there looking at this trusty guy. And if it wasn't my heart that was moved by compassion, <laughs> it was an organ that was close enough. <laughs> and I found myself saying, um, sir, um, all this Gandhi stuff is totally news to me. <laughs> and I wasn't planning on fasting. And, uh, you know, nobody else would eat your greens. I would be willing to. And sure, he looked at, you know, Abernathy, you know, the other guy. And you know, I could, it was easy to see that on a list of four people, I said, <laughs> I was number four, or maybe further down. <laughs> Greens too, but and if Dr. King had said, even quietly, well, we're all kind of in this together, you know. I, this was this was an army and discipline. And if he could say we're all in, we're, we're all following the plan here. Yes, sir. No, pro you know, take it away. But Dr. King just sort of shrugged. Sure, if, if uh, nobody else would use it, sure. And so he 
was something less than great enthusiasm. <laughs> Opened a little slot and slid the plate through. Gave me a plastic fork so I could turn it into a weapon. <laughs> and uh, got the plate. I had to turn away. I was so hungry. I was embarrassed for Dr. King to see me about what I was about to do. And I stuck the fork in and went into the greens a little ways and then it stopped. And I thought, stop, what's this? Is there some kind of trick here? I lifted it up. And it turns out that the greens were a facade. They were a covering because underneath them there was a couple of big, thick pieces of wonderful Alabama country ham. <laughs> too bad for me. Oh, wow. too. <laughs> oh, I ate every last. <laughs> True story. It's the story of how I ate Dr. King's dinner, and I just say that uh, aside from really being good, that 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 plateful in that context with that background, it's been nourishing me ever since. And uh, it was only one of many kind of very important shaping experiences for me that I didn't put in this book because it was this book was for the movement. But I did put in this one. There's others we don't have time to go through, but now I think, uh, can we turn off this light to get a better sure. image on the slide? Will I, will, we'll see, Lewis, if you're able to see, you're still able to see me in your camera. Okay. But, uh, well, maybe now, yeah, I'm almost giving out. I just want you to see the colors on these slides. Can you still see me? Mm -hmm. I, uh, not so much. Not too good, here. No. I can see the real you and the picture. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not featured at all. So there's the jail. Behind someone, I'm a little taller. The, the city hall in Selma now is the police department. And uh, I went down there last November to do research for an update to my book. And the police chief was very, was a black, was a black police chief. They have a black mayor. Majority of the city council are black members. So they have significant political presence there. He was very cooperative, let me go up and see it, because they weren't really using it. And uh, that was an interesting experience. Thank goodness the doors didn't lock. <laughs> now, this is one of the this is this slide's about one of the turning points in the whole Selma struggle. And it has a resonance to today that I didn't realize until I went back and looked at it. Because on the left is Jimmy Lee Jackson, who lived in Marion, about 25 miles away from Selma. And the guy on the right is named James Fowler. He was an Alabama State Trooper. And in the middle of February, late in February of 1965, there was a little march at night in Marion. Marion is a little town that has a town square with a courthouse in the middle and there's a church right on the edge of the square. They had a civil rights mass meeting in the church and then they had a, they went out to march around the square before they went home. And when they went out to march around the square, I don't know if, well, this is portrayed in the movie and it's done pretty well. They went outside, they got outside the church and then all of a sudden the street lights all were turned off. And then they were attacked by state troopers and uh, sheriff's deputies and who knows who else, including Jim Clark, who was from Selma, from the next county over, Dallas, Dallas County. He was not in his jurisdiction, but he showed up there. He was identified. He was in civilian clothes. So this was a planned thing that he had heard about. He wanted to get in on. And Jimmy Lee Jackson was there with several members of his family, and they tried to run away from the attack, and they saw a little mostly black uh, oriented little sort of hole in the wall cafe that they were going past, and they ran in there to try to get away from the violence. And this guy, the state trooper, followed him in, and he took a whack at Jimmy Lee Jackson's grandfather, Cager Lee, who was there, an old man. And I don't know, Jimmy Lee Jackson maybe pushed him away or something, and Fowler pulled out his gun and shot him. If you know the 
And about a week later, Jim Lee Jackson died. He was in the hospital for a few days, and, and then he died. And so, what do we have here? We have a police officer shooting down an unarmed young black man. Well, that police shooting, killing young black man was not at the top of the list of issues in Selva in 1965. However, it was a fact of life in that community. This was, not a, this was not a new thing, as a matter of fact. A year later, this same guy, Fowler, shot and killed another young unarmed black man. There were two grand juries that looked into the killing of, Dr. of uh, Jimothy Jackson. They didn't do anything. The, uh, the second fellow, whose identity only came, up, was, came to light much later, they never looked into him at all. And 45 years later, 2010, 45 years later, there were, there were important members of the state legislature who were black politicians that, that were holding high position in the legislature. They were all Democrats, and the Democrats had control of the legislature. And they insisted that some prosecutors look into this cold, cold case. And they did, and they, find, they finally indicted this guy Fowler on second degree manslaughter. And he copped a plea. And they sentenced him to six months. And he actually served five. And then his lawyer went to the judge and said, my client is very sick. Will you let him out? So they did. So 45 years later, second degree manslaughter, five months. <coughs> How much did Jimmy Jackson's life matter? Yes. So, nonetheless, it wasn't without this effect because it really pushed the community, the, the energy level and the anger to a, the, kind of the boiling point where the idea of marching all the way to Montgomery to demand something, some, a lot of changes, both in voting and in the way people were treated, was crystallized. So, there is, on the right, that's Cager Lee, Jimmy Jackson's grandfather, and uh, his mother and a cousin. There's a little Catholic hospital in Selma, Good Samaritan Hospital. That's where Jimmy Jackson was the last few days of his life. This is a little roadside cemetery near Marion, where Jimmy Lee Jackson is buried. And in that cemetery, you can see a couple of the other have small pistol over here. This is a wooden cross over here. It's a very humble um, cemetery right by the side of the road, a hot state highway. And I went to visit it last November. I took this picture. And I came up close. Let's see here. Wait, don't tell me I forgot this. Ah. <coughs> yeah, it looks like I did. How did I do that? Um, I have a close up of this head stuff. And if I come across it later, we can stop for it. But I just want to point out, um, you see these orange spots? Those are bullet marks. And you see there, there's a divot out of it that was blown out by bullets. And there are several other marks where that are not so clear, especially at this size, uh, that were made by gunfire. So they're, they're using still, they're still using Julie Jackson as a target. Mm. There. Yes. Um, that's a it's not a small thing. This is Dr. King and a young Ralph Abernathy and John Lewis behind the hearse that took Jimmy Lee Jackson out there. It was raining that day, and that was one of the days when they asked me to march around Dr. King. And I think it was that occasion when I was doing my research that I where the authorities felt there may well have been somebody uh, trying to get aid for him. Besides my being there, I think he was well protected by the number of umbrellas because it was raining. Viola Liuzzo, she was a white woman who was shot down by a Klan the day the march to Montgomery finished on Highway 80 east of Selma. This is a marker for her. Um, I'll say a little bit about Selma now. I visited there in November, visited there again in March. This is the church, Brown Chapel AME Church, which was the headquarters for the movement in 1965. 
And this is a picture taken in March. You can see it's well kept, and it's basically a national monument, even though it's still a church and a working church. But, um, and the street in front of it used to be called uh, Lauderdale Street, and they changed it to Martin Luther King. Avenue. And that looks pretty neat and well kept. But if you walk down that way to the corner, so you can see uh, the corner just less than a block away. Here's the house that's burned out, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. And I took this picture, and then I'm looking this way across the street, and then I turned around, okay, look the other way. And you got to look close to this picture, this house, you see the, the downstairs windows are boarded up, the upstairs windows are mostly broken, the house is empty. And in the whole huge swath of the city, that's mainly uh, black occupied, there's just house after house after house after house after house like that. Just, mm. It's just dreadful. And the fact is, 50 years later, the poverty level in Selma and in Dallas County is the highest in the state of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And then there's a there's a string of ten counties they call the Black Belt that goes across the state at that at that meridian. And Dallas County, where Selma is, is one of them. And those counties, except for Montgomery County, where the capital is, those ten count Black Belt counties have the, the highest poverty rates in the state. And Alabama has one of the highest poverty rates in the country. And some of you who saw the movie and maybe read some about people, there's some controversy about the movie. You may recall that there was some question raised about the way they they had showed Dr. King debating with Lyndon Johnson in the Oval Office about whether they should push for a Voting Rights Act in early 1965 or whether they should wait for a while and Johnson said he wanted to push for his anti-poverty program first. Mm -hmm. And I guess I've read that the the discussion didn't really happen the way that they portrayed it in the movie, but especially when I saw that after I'd been to Selma in November, I found myself thinking, you know what, maybe that debate that they portray in the script is not true to the transcripts of the tapes that they had all of the time. On the other hand, I do know that Lyndon Johnson was serious about working against poverty, and I also know that 50 years after they got the Voting Rights Act, Selma, Dallas County of Black Belt, the question of poverty is just as bad, just as real as it was 50 years ago. And so the, the tension between those priorities was legitimate and real. It wasn't a matter of personality. And Lyndon Johnson, for all his faults, he was the best friend the civil rights movement ever had in the White House. Um, and he was serious about poverty. He was serious about the Vietnam War, too. The War on Poverty and Vietnam War lost both wars. Mm -hmm. Tragedy there. So th this, um, this is downtown. This building, that's what used to be City Hall. The third floor, that's where I was in the county jail. Second floor, that's where I was in the jail with Dr. King. And this building, where you see, boarded up. It's empty. Um, this was where the SNCC office was, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was busy. The town, most of the, or at least the large swaths of this downtown are empty, just like that building. And in fact, this, this is a, a very attractive mural and memorial to Unitarian minister, James Reeb, who was beaten to death uh, right downtown. This lot here is used to be occupied by a place called the Silver Moon Cafe, which was a, a place where some very low-life white folks hung out. And the people who came out and beat James Reeb came out of it. And you see, it's gone now. And they have this very colorful, and I think impressive, mural on the wall here, and this memorial that I, I, I think I think the Unitarians put that up, but I'm not sure. But, well, that looks kind of nice. But, I didn't take a picture of this, but this is on a corner. The whole rest of the block, the buildings are all empty. 
for mm -hmm. it. Now. This is right downtown. It's just a couple blocks from the city hall park. So that's true really across the downtown. There we are. There's Jim Lee Jackson's uh, headstone closer up. You can see these marks. This one, this one. one over there. Several up there. That's, uh, this one. So, and this is the house I lived in. Well, I would say. If, again, those who saw the movie, you may remember a character named Mrs. Amelia Boynton. She's the one who got the tar knocked out of her and uh, knocked out, knocked flat on the bridge in the attack on, mm -hmm. uh, on March 7th. She was also, there was a scene, a very brief scene, uh, about, in the movie about Mrs. King going to the church to <coughs> talk to Malcolm X while her husband was still in jail. And she's feeling very nervous about it. She says she doesn't feel prepared. And this, there's this very kind of imposing black woman walking with her who stops her and says, now wait a minute, you've been prepared by the experience of surviving slavery, your ancestors, and you know, it gives her sort of a, an intense pep talk for about two minutes. Well, that's Mrs. Boynton. And uh, when I saw that movie, when I saw that, and that scene, even though it only lasted a couple of minutes, the hair stood up back on the back of my neck. So the actress, somebody I don't know, Lorraine Toussaint, I, if I ever see her, I'm going to bow down to her. Because, by golly, two minutes, she was Mrs. Boynton. I mean, to tell you, talked like her, looked like her, carried herself like her. The expression and the intensity, and it was really something short. And Mrs. Boynton had, she was nobody to mess with. Um, she had been active in the struggle in Selma for something like 40 years. She's, she's still alive. If you've seen pictures of, uh, President Obama walking across the bridge in Selma, which were pretty widely distributed, next to him is a woman in a wheelchair. Yeah. That's yeah. Mrs. Boynton. Yeah. She's like 103 yeah. or 104. Yeah, she's still alive. And <clears throat> this was her house. So she was a she was an established middle class black woman of substance, not rich necessarily. But this was a, a middle class block, and she moved some time ago. And she was living in. Tuskegee, probably in assisted living, and her house was supposed to be turned into a little museum. And this was this picture was taken in November. It was the same in March last month, except there was a little sign in front of it talking about how there's still somebody still dreaming about the museum. But you can't see it from this side. The other side, the roof is falling in. So it's, it was really upsetting to me to see this. I mean, I, I lived there. The city deserves better. Mrs. Boynt deserves better. The movement deserves better. One thing they did do, they changed the name. You saw on Martin Luther King Street, or Avenue. Well, they've changed several blocks of the street there, where this house is. It used to be called Lapsley Street. And several blocks of it now are called Boynton's Avenue. And, I get, and there's several other streets that, that have been renamed for civil rights figures. And I guess the fact is that it's much cheaper to buy a few street signs yeah. than to rebuild wow. neighborhoods. And I guess that's all they can afford. But still, it was it was tough. Not everything is like that, though. Well, why are things so bad? There's a lot of reasons, but this is one of them. This is nine of them, actually. No, two, four, six, seven. Selma had about almost 30,000 population when I was there in 1965. It's got a little less than 20,000 today. And yet, on the main business, two main business streets, I counted 15 payday loan uh, operations. And these are, I took pictures of a whole bunch of them. They were in color. And I made this collage. Uh, some of them are like, like two of them in the same little strip mall. Two or three of them right next to each other. And these are the outfits that can charge 400% interest. Right, right. And they, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it, it feels to me like a return of the plantation system. Yeah. Because people get trapped in it. And they're very poorly regulated. The legislature, the politics of Alabama, for a long, 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 long time has been very corrupt. And these kinds of outfits, they're mm. connected with big banks behind various co corporate curtains. They have plenty of money to 
by political indifference and to stall political regulation. Um, and it was really, and it's interesting to me because all these little shops, I didn't bring the color versions, they're all very brightly colored and well lit. So they're not very big, but you know, ah, everything's going to be great. Your future is bright. Oh man, it just made my blood boil. There are other factors as well, but this is one. I'm very grateful that in North Carolina these things, these operations have been largely run out of the state. And I guess our current yeah, legislature yeah. wants to turn them loose. That would be something good to stop along with many other things. Now this is an oak tree. And I'm sorry, it doesn't even quite as uh, There are magnificent old oak trees covered with this moss, and it's, they are part of what's known as the Old Oak Cemetery in Selma. It's the main cemetery in Selma. And these really magnificent old, old oak trees are at the end called Confederate Corner. And in the closing days of the Civil War, late March or the April of 1865, there was a bit of a battle around Selma, because Selma was a major arms and weapons manufacturing town for the Confederacy. And the Union Army sent a force down from Tennessee, they rode all the way across Alabama, to destroy all that stuff. And General Nathan Bedford Forrest, Confederate general, he, he didn't have much of an army left, but he was supposed to defend Selma, and he sort of made a stand, and then ran off. Okay, and, and the Union took Selma, and the retreating Confederate forces were supposed to destroy all weapons. They did what they could, but they neglected a few casks of whiskey, so the story goes anyway, which were found by the Union troops, which who proceeded to get roaring drunk for two or three days as long as the whiskey lasted, and supposedly terrorized the local inhabitants, and they have not forgotten it to the point of anyway. And near, near the bridge, near the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Edmund Pettus was a Confederate general, he was buried in that cemetery, there are some people, there's a billboard. This billboard was standing there last month along Highway 80, not far from the Pettus Bridge, inviting folks to visit historic sites of a different character that we have been seeing here. So the Friends of Forest, the Friends of Nathan Bedford Forest, who we're talking about. And these folks are so they are building a monument to Nathan Bedford Forest. You see it there, as it was a few years ago. The base, a big, heavy stone base, it weighs about 10,000 pounds. And then this uh, metal bust of the guy. And they wanted to have it downtown. In fact, they set it up downtown in early 2001. And then there were some folks who didn't like that idea. We got all sorts of protests. And just about that time, the fellow who was, had just been elected mayor, when I got there, a guy named Joe Smitherman, he had been mayor for most of 36 years since then, in 2000, with a very brief intermission. And he was finally defeated by a black man, and a black fellow named, took over as mayor. And one of the first things that came, landed on this guy's, this new mayor's desk, were angry you know, a group of angry protesters who said, how dare you let this guy be set up in front of a, the, the city historic museum that we're setting up downtown. And the, and the mayor said, what? What? I never heard anything. What's going on here? Because the other mayor hadn't, previous mayor hadn't told him anything about it. And anyway, they forced him to move it. So they moved it to the old Oak Cemetery. And uh, let's say they have this big section called Confederate Corner. Well, who was Nathan Bedford for? This is not, I don't want to give you a lecture about the guy. He was one of the wealthiest men in the South before the Civil War, and he made his money as a slave dealer, buying and selling slaves. I read a biography about him, and it was an interesting thing. Uh, being a slave merchant in many places in the South, while it was clearly necessary, it was kind of like being an abortionist before Roe versus Wade. You were performing a public service, but nobody wanted to know you. He was not really respectable. And he was not a gentleman like Robert E. Lee and stuff. He didn't go to West Point. He had no formal military training. But it appears he was quite a, a, a skilled, talented 
fighter. And there's a lot of folks who are nostalgic for the Confederacy and decided they like him a whole lot better than, say, Robert E. Lee, who was much more gentle than Lee. And he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And he was commander of forces in western Tennessee who massacred a large unit of black Union soldiers after they had surrendered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just Civil War combat aside, these, there were folks in Selma, black activists in Selma, who were really, really offended about a monument to Nathan Bedford Forrest. I mean, uh, hey, Edmund Pettus was a Confederate general too. Well, he's already buried in the Selma Cemetery. He's been there for a long time. Um, and they're kind of used to having his name on the bridge. It's a civil rights symbol. But for us, it's a different kettle of fish. This business about the Ku Klux Klan. This business about being a slave merchant. This business about being a founder. He's supposed to be the first grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. That makes it not so much fun. So there's been controversy over that for 15 years. And as a matter of fact, three years ago, last month, Somebody snuck into the cemetery, and you will notice that uh, General Forrest had lost his head. <laughs> I, and evidently, the theft was accomplished in a very skillful way. There were people who wanted to demolish the whole thing, but like I say, this, this base weighs about 10,000 pounds. You're not going to get it into Bubba's truck, okay? <laughs> but they, they disappeared. But the people who put it up, they say they got a new one, they're ready. And next month, in May, next month, they're going to have a formal, whatever you want to call it. Unveiling. Unveiling. <laughs> uh, uh, were, they sued the city. The and <laughs> they won. The city lost. And they actually got control of about a, a new acre of land in this city cemetery for, these are some pictures of this section. I went there in November, and the place was covered with brand new better flags. These are mostly unknown, the little, the little headstones say unknown Confederate souls. Okay, and there's a big, big memorial already, and uh, they're putting in all kinds of fancy security systems to protect the <coughs> general force's head. <laughs> and uh, these are the folks who are principally responsible for it. The woman in the red jacket is named Pat Godwin. And uh, uh, the guy in a blue shirt is uh, Kis Kiskaden, I forget his first name, Scott, I think. He's sort of handling the billing, and she's done, she's the head of the United Daughters of the Confederacy for Selma. She lives in sort of a ranch right south of Selma, she calls Fort Dixie. <laughs> and every, every July, for the last 15 years, she has given a big birthday party for General Nathan Bedford Forrest, and people come from all over the South. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this was, I learned about this when I was doing an update for my book, and this, was, this became important to me to learn about, because, hey, here we are in Fayetteville. Uh, I don't think we think about this much here. And yet, this is a real factor. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, the tip of an iceberg. <coughs> and I have a picture which I didn't put in this collection of the back of this guy's truck. It's got all these uh, bumper stickers that are in favor of secession. And he's a, he's a kind of vowed secession. He wants the South to secede. The South should have won the Civil War. They were right. Lincoln was a war criminal and so on and so forth. Um, these people are not gone. And while they're not respectable in terms of mainline politics, they are able to make their wow. presence known. This is a billboard that was put up in somewhere in Florida, <coughs> uh, 2013. The League of the South. And they put up one just like it in Montgomery a year ago, right by Interstate 85. <coughs> and it's interesting, it was only up a few days. And, then, and I, it was not, so far as I know, protests from black people or black leadership that got it brought down. It was sort of white political image makers. No, 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 no. We, we, we can't have this. This is not up to our image. So Bad for anyway, business. 
Not me. Yeah. Yeah. They still have their website. Uh, yeah, all the organization definitely exists. There's lots of them. Well, a little bit more about Selma while I was there. Um, I didn't hear Dr. Uh, I didn't hear President Obama's speech. They had a street festival where you're going to sell stuff, and I brought several cartons of my books down there, and I paid good money to have a table. And I had done this ten years ago in 2005, and I had a 40th anniversary edition of my book, and it sold very well because the street festival was right around the corner from the bridge where all people were marching over. This time, though. They had a plan to have it right down there again, but the plans all went out the window when some guy named Obama decided to come. <laughs> and first he came, when he announced he was going to come, they, the White House said he would go to this church, the Brown Chapel Church, the headquarters of the movie, he'd speak there. I knew as soon as I heard that it was a dumb idea, because President Obama comes to Selma, you know, as soon as that was announced, the turnout went up by about 25,000 people. Because there were a whole, and you just knew, mm -hmm. I knew, nobody had to tell me, that there were church folks from Atlanta to Jackson and lots of places in between who were to get on those buses and drive to Selma to see the first black man. Mm -hmm. If they had to, you know, hell, high water, mm -hmm. or the Confederate Army. And, and when they get there, are you going to tell them that a church that will hold 500 people, that, and, and they're not going to get in because there was, a, there was supposed to be a hundred congressmen there. That's enough to call out the guard anyway. And plus all sorts of import, you know, important people, dignitaries, yada, 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 yada. They would have filled that church in a minute and nobody ordinary would have got in. Yeah. And, I mean, I can't imagine they even thought that, but maybe it was a diversion. But anyway, they decided... No, you got to do it at the foot of the bridge, where people can get. But then, when they were going to do that, when they announced that, just a few days before the, uh, the event, the Secret Service came in and said, you know what, this thing about street fair, forget it. Because you got to block up an area of you know, 8, 10, 12 blocks. And they put these barricades all around. And you couldn't get in on the Saturday morning when, when the street festival was supposed to happen, but when Obama was going to come, you couldn't get into it unless you lined up, and people lined up for hours, and you went through airport-type security and pat down and all that sort of stuff. I mean, that, that, this is necessary. I, I mean, I was nervous about it when I heard Obama was coming. Because there's some crazy people down there. So anyway, then the street festival got shunted off, you know, way down around the corner and back and back and beyond, and I didn't sell hardly anything. Oh well. But I also didn't hear Obama's speech. I didn't see him. But you know what? That's okay. I've heard him speak. And I knew what he was going to say. He was going to say, we've come a long way, but we're not there yet. Right? Is that what he said? That's yeah, about right. it. Yeah. That's what they always say. It is true. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's probably what I would have said if I had been, you know, for some reason asked to give a speech. But anyway, I didn't worry. They had a bunch of official stuff. And I didn't go to much of that. And I missed my chance to grow up. But there's one thing I didn't give up, didn't miss on, miss out on. Every year since the early 90s, as part of what they call the Bridge Crossing Jubilee, they have a beauty pageant. And here it is. These are some dancers. And there's the, the one on the left is the new queen or new princess, and I forget the other two, the last year's whatever. I stumbled across this. When I went down there with my son in 92 or 93, and I just I have to say I stood by the door of the auditorium with my jaw on the floor because there they were, about eight or ten of these young women strutting their stuff, and the place was packed, and people were yelling and screaming and cheering and carrying on. And after all, the young women were all from around the region, of around Selma. And you got to figure they're from high schools where, you know, you're playing against them in basketball and football and everything else, so there's lots of local kinds of rivalries and people are cheering for them. And there's something unforgettable about seeing a young woman in a bathing suit.
strutting her stuff and reciting the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> okay, and I, I, I admit it, I wanted to see it again. And, but this was interesting because, and I also found myself thinking, and, and many of you here are associated with the National Organization of Women, so this is maybe something to chew on, I found myself thinking, my feminist friends would be having fits. <laughs> what? Commodifying, sexualizing these young women, and yada, 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 you know? And I say, yeah, the only thing to say about that is, this is their community, and this was their idea, and I guess this is what they want to do. It wasn't my idea. Did they get local control or not? Well, anyway, they've been doing it, but this time, it's interesting. 2015, I don't know the, the interim, but in the interim, somebody preached some go feminist gospel to them. How do I know that? Well, because A, no bathing suits. B, among the, the um, candidates, there were about three or four. I don't even know the right, excuse me if I say something offensive. There were some rather large, non-standard, non-bathing suit type shaped young women. Somebody went out of their way. And they also, they preached us, preached at us at the beginning. None of this screaming and hollering. No booing at anybody. We, you know, everybody's, we got to be nice to everybody. And I thought, whoa, what have, what have I missed? Well, I mean, the first time I was there, it was pretty rowdy. So, and this young woman here, she has pictures of Jimmy Lee Jackson and others, so there was still some civil rights aspect to it. But I have to say, this was still a fascinating, and the princess gets to ride, I don't know, I guess in the car or something, when they go over the bridge. So, Obama went over the bridge on Saturday, and they had a if you saw the picture of him going over the bridge, that was a very carefully selected, choreographed thing. The folks got to go over the next day, and this is from the next day, Sunday. And in fact, I went down there in the middle of the afternoon, and you just, I mean, a sardine can is practically empty compared to that bridge that I've been. And I got down as far where I could, I was right here, you know, right near the edge, and I looked at and I said, you know, I've been over this bridge lots of times, <laughs> and I don't feel like I can squeeze. I'm just going to sit here and watch folks, which I did, and it was great. But finally, I turned and walked down a little ways. Uh, the street comes, you know, just over the bridge, and down it goes. Uh, it's called Broad Street, and then there's the street crossways, Water Avenue. That's where the street festival was supposed to be, but it wasn't. So after a while, I just wandered down a little bit into the next block, and people were waiting, waiting to uh, um, take their turn to go across the bridge, and they were just inching along. They had been doing it for hours. And uh, as I came down the block, there was a whole big group of folks, uh, I don't know, hundreds of them, something, lined up like a military unit, maybe a dozen across, and then rows and rows of them, and they were all these uh, uh, very handsome looking black men in black suits, white shirts, black uh, bow ties, and they had, they were masons of some sort, and they had funny little kind of aprons they were wearing, their regalia, and they were lined up like a, like a <coughs> army or unit, sort of standing there, waiting their turn quietly, and I just sort of sauntering past, you go in the other direction, and then one of them on the end, He's sort of looking off in the distance, and then suddenly he looks at me and says, Hey, I just saw you on TV. I said, Really? And sure enough, I looked, he sort of pointed, and I turned around and looked across the street, and this is a, the biggest flat screen TV you ever saw. And this was a trailer that was on top of it. And there's a, a documentary about the Selma movement that was made by a fellow named Steve Crump, who's a TV newsman in Charlotte. I had actually met him ten years ago. He was in Selma, and he interviewed me for something he did for that. And he did, he's, I don't know where this is online, but 
um, he came and talked to me, and you know, there I am, a talking head in this thing. <laughs> I mean, I knew he did this, but I had no idea that they were showing it down here. And so lots of people were standing, I got to watch the whole thing a couple of times, probably waiting for their turn. That was my 15 minutes of semi-fame. <laughs> and then I sort of turned around, and this little fellow, he kept up and up. And I, you know, and I imagined a uh, uh, conversation. Hey, well, is there a future for the civil rights movement? And he just says, got it covered, dude. <laughs> you can see mom or somebody back there, she agreed. <laughs> it just seemed too cute. The other thing I didn't get a picture of, those of you who don't know me, I, I just got my beard trimmed and radically in my haircut a month ago. I mean, a week ago, on Monday. I usually do it every few months. So I had a really full beard. And I was sitting behind my little table, not selling my books. <laughs> at, at supposedly, I go to part of the street festival. Things were pretty quiet. And had a couple of folding chairs. And this young black girl came along and sat down in one of them to get a little rest. And she sat there for a couple of minutes. And then she looked over at me and she said, you Santa Claus? <laughs> no, I'm trying to be the Grinch. <laughs> uh uh, you Santa Claus. <laughs> well, where are your elves? My elves? They're on vacation. <laughs> so am I. Well, then why aren't they with you? What? You think they would put up with me all year? They went to Hawaii. <laughs> I won't see them again until August. <laughs> it was so cute. <laughs> and it had been freezing that morning. So, uh, we can turn the light back on, I think. This is really, as much as I want to say it formally, I mean, I appreciate your, it's 8.30, so it's not too bad. If there are questions or comments, or something you got to add, Something you want me to go back to? Um, I guess I will want to say one, one parenthesis. Um, when this book first came out in 1974, it had a happy ending because the black citizens of Selma and most of the South were now able to vote. And one of the first things they did in Selma was they had an election for sheriff and Wilson Baker who was the good cop, even though he was a good cop segregationist, he ran against Jim Clark and beat him with black votes. And he was a very good sheriff. He died in office in 1975. And the, my story ends with uh, Wilson Baker beating Jim Clark. So it's, it's an upbeat ending. But when I came back to update it, it an awful lot has been rolled back. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we're, right. we're, we're in much yeah. the same shape in North Carolina. Yeah, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail yeah. about this because yeah. we're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Even though, I mean, Alabama has lots of specifics, but we don't necessarily have to go into all that because it's the same same song, different verse. Mm -hmm. um, and that's discouraging. I, I wish I could say it was all wonderful, but I can't. You know, the poverty there, the fact the house I lived in has fallen down. It was a nice enough house. No need for that. The city, the exploitation, the lack of industry, mm -hmm. the politics. I mean, and I will say also, looked around. I didn't see, I didn't see any, any great movement coming. I didn't see it. I think we've been luckier here in North Carolina with Memorial Monday, but it hasn't exactly run them rascals out of office yet. I mean, I'm still hopeful about it, but. I don't see anything like that in Alabama. So, uh, it's, it's, I had a great time visiting Selma for this occasion, and I'm, I mean, I still feel very lucky and honored to have had my little part in it. Uh, but I, it wasn't near the celebration that it should have been. So. Two quick things. First of all, reminding people you're, you're, you're too kind to yourself, or too 
Shine for Yourself. That was the first good book to come out on Selma, and one of the first good books to come out on an event in the Civil Rights Movement when it came out in 74. And it influenced a lot of historians to do some other work after that. Well, thank you. I think that was a good one. Thank you. And the, I don't know, I hope that maybe I'm hopeful, but yesterday evening's news on um, the redistricting case oh, yeah. in North Carolina, the, Mar the Margaret Dixon versus Rucco mm -hmm. case, and the fact that the, the court, the Supreme Court, five to four, of course, but five to four, is using an Alabama case to revisit the uh, court, the, the packing of black voters into districts in order to strengthen Republican control of the state legislature. That may be a good thing. We don't know yet where it's going, but it's better news than what we've had in the last That's true. Yeah. few uh, until the last couple of months when those two decisions have come out. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm part of a generation that has been trained to think somehow we're entitled to fix any mess by the next election. And I was mindful that in preparing for the update of my book, the regime in Alabama that disfranchised black people and a great many poor white people as well was put into place in 1901. It was 64 years before that regime was overthrown. 64 years. And so my generation's training that stuff can happen fast. And I, I think we got to get over that because I don't think it's going to happen again. Well, I mean, I don't know the future, but I don't think they'll have a fact. Did you have a question? Oh. Uh, 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 why was the civil rights movement called the civil rights movement? Why wasn't it called something else? Well, I don't know. I, well, it wasn't up to me to call it that. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, one reason was because in those days, the demands were about... <coughs> mainly about things that were involved, or enshrined in, in the Bill of Rights and, and yeah. um, constitutional amendments relating to that. Yeah. And so, we were talking about rights of, that yeah. were supposed to involve citizens and yeah. civic affairs. Now, that's my interpretation of that. I, I, I don't, like I say, I didn't give it that name. and I, I, it was, well established when I came along, so I'm not sure. A, a part, the reverse part of it is the, 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 the capstone of the civil rights, civil rights movement legally is the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which specifically deals with enforcing those 14th Amendment rights, specifically in, uh, in access to public facilities, etc. That is the goal, was one of the things that made it be the civil rights movement. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. <clears throat> um, I remember it was written back in February in the Fayetteville Observer. You were interviewed, and um, you probably remember more of what you said in that interview um, that kind of struck me, and that was the relationship of white folks in the struggle for black liberation. There's some comment in there. Um, so that brings me to my question, how important is it for white folks to be part of black liberation? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know how much benefit I was, my presence was to the movement. It was a great benefit to me, and I'm pretty sure I didn't get in the way much. Uh, the mistakes I made were pretty small, fortunately, and and I never fancied myself as a civil rights leader, even when in training. Uh, I mean, doc, Dr. King's organization was sort of integrated. There, were, I wasn't the only white person in it, but there weren't many, so it was run by people of color. Same was true for, as far as I knew, the other major organizations, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was certainly as the way it should have been. At the same time, once I got to Selma, and I got familiar with some folks who were working for SNCC, the, the concept and the 
the impulse that later, about a year later, surfaced in the phrase black power was already bubbling behind the scenes and under the surface. And that was, part of that was, uh, black folks don't have enough control of their movement, and white folks don't have to go home or go to some place where you can be useful among other white folks. And I understood that pretty, pretty early on, that that sentiment was rising. It wasn't rising the same way in Dr. King's organization, but it was, but SCLC, Dr. King's group, was affected by it. And it was pretty clear to me before too long that, again, my sense that I was there going to school was true in, in more ways than one. And one way was when I learned enough, whatever enough was, no, I wasn't getting credits, I wasn't looking for a degree, um, I'd have to make some choices. Was, was I going to become a professional organizer? If I was, I'd probably have to go find some white community, mostly white community anyway, to organize. And I pretty soon decided I was not really cut out to be a professional organizer. And so, and then further, further uh, practical working with that question for me was kind of cut short because the Vietnam War came along. And whereas I started 1965 not subject to the draft immediately because President Kennedy had uh, indefinitely deferred married men from the draft in like 1962. And I was, I was recently married then. So I didn't have to worry about it. And also I never thought about Vietnam, although it was happening. And if you've seen the movie, there are two couple of times in the movie where people say at these mass meetings, if Lyndon Johnson can send U.S. soldiers to fight for and die for freedom in Vietnam, then by golly, why can't he send some to Alabama to stop this mess so we can vote here? Well, those statements were really made. I really heard those things. And, I mean, I didn't know anything about Vietnam. Yeah. But I began to learn as the spring went on. Because it was like the, there's a phrase in the Bible about a cloud no bigger than a man's hand. And it gets to be bigger and bigger. And then pretty soon you got a hellacious storm going. That's the way the Vietnam War was. And so before the summer was over, I had to be thinking about what to do about that. And that's different from, say, in What's my role in the civil rights movement? <laughs> that was a different set of kettle of fish. But um, it was one, before long, the passage of these other young white folks in the movement was pretty well completed. And um, there was, they really mostly went home or wherever they were, where they were headed. Now, in terms of ongoing struggles, situations have changed a lot. And I think there's a lot of functional cooperation that's possible and, and even imperative. Like, for instance, um, Reverend Barber and the NACP, I've heard him speak and say, the NACP has got to be multiracial. I mean, I've heard him say that. Yeah. And I have seen him try to carry it out. Now, now, the NACP is a top-down organization. You know, it has been ever since Roy Wilkins in the late 40s. So, it's a little different from, from the way a lot of white folks would do things. But, I've, I mean, I've been to Moral Monday rallies, and, and you had folks of different colors and different perspectives on that platform and in the crowd, and affirmatively so. And if there was ever going to, if there's ever going to be a return to rationality in the politics of North Carolina, Black folk and white folk and brown folk have got to be able to collaborate at least. Okay, now how y'all how how that happens is a little bit above my pay grade, but I can see we're not. I mean, we're in this sinking boat together, Absolutely. and uh, we got to work together to get it to get it back and flow. Now there's other aspects of it as well. Um, the matter of that that people are noticing. Okay? Um, I was living here when, somebody can help me, the, the name of the lawyer here who came up with all the data about the uh, traffic stops of black people, four times as many as there were white people in, in, in Fayetteville, 
He was a black lawyer here. Down the radio. I think he was a re Troy somebody Williams. told me he's a Republican. Troy Williams. Troy Williams. Troy Williams. Troy Williams. Troy Williams. Yeah, raised all sorts of canes. Got the police chief uh, fired and stuff. And uh, I, I remember going downtown to the library with my lady Wendy, and there was a meeting there about this. The police, well, the you know, community room, it was packed wall to wall, except for the Tennessees and a couple of others. My lady Wendy and I were the only white people who were there that weren't on the clock. There were a few others from the newspaper, the police chief, and you know, like that. They were all working. And I re it was really educational to me, here I am in Fayetteville with this particular background, that what was a reality for people of color in Fayetteville in 2013, 2012, was white people could be almost totally oblivious to it because our experience, you know, well, experiences were different. Well, I moved to Durham. Durham happens to have the high, highest voting percentage Democrat, liberal, blah, blah, blah in the state of 100 counties. And guess what? It's got the same statistics. The same. Yeah. And it's a big scandal up there, too. And they don't have to figure it out. Well, I don't know exactly how to fix all that stuff. And I was thinking about shooting down black people, cops, and getting away with it. I'm glad to see that uh, become a big deal. And I don't know exactly know how you're going to fix it, because this isn't something where Congress can pass a law, because you've got, what, 20,000 police departments? There, there's, not one, there's not one button to push to fix it. So there's going to be a lot of struggles in a lot of places. Well, I think the same thing. There's going to have to be some way white people and people of color work together on this. Again, I don't have a formula, but uh, we they're definitely in this in this pickle together. So I think there's lots of opportunities. I, um, I worry sometimes, which since I'm close to a lot of academic communities, I think there gets to be too much worry about little things, and, and maybe this will get me in trouble. I hear a lot of talk about microaggressions. Well, microaggressions, I think, are Microaggressions deserve micro attention. <laughs> Macroaggressions deserve macro attention. What do I mean? Somebody who talks about you people, okay, getting you in trouble. And people, you know, okay, there, there, there are things to say and not say that are troublesome. At the same time, we have a, we have a criminal justice system which locks up people of color, particularly young men of color, way disproportionately to white people, and this is not new, you know, mass incarceration. That is a, that is a big aggression. In my, I'm not giving you my opinion about this. That's a big one. And if I had, you know, a, hundred, three, a gallon of uh, attention put into this, I'd put a lot more attention into reshaping the criminal justice system than I would in worrying over somebody doesn't know how to talk right. Uh, I mean, that seems to me to be almost an aspect of privilege. Privileged college kids can throw a tantrum about something somebody said. In fact, I, I read some, a thing about a college president somewhere up north who had to issue a public apology, supposedly, because she put out a statement that said, all lives matter. And there were people on her campus who said, how dare you? The proper language is Black Lives Matter. So she had to apologize. You know what? Locking up black people way disproportionately and ruining their lives in a machine industrial manner, that really matters more, frankly. And, I mean, to me. And a bunch of, that, that's what a bunch of college campus silliness adds up, in my, in my opinion, and, and maybe I'm it's just so get in trouble. It's no. just so hard to get beyond, and right, I mean, it's just so hard to get people to um, to talk about the issue of racism. Um, and I, I, it's, 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 no one wants to, to elevate that discussion. Now, we have this great 
three part series here. Um, cracking the code. Um, and I, 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 it, it, I wished more would have participated in in that, but there never is any large forum or a consistent forum to talk about issues where black folks, white folks, um, Hispanics could be present and have an opportunity to, to talk things out. Um, I, it's just rather simplistic, but I've always believed that, and I don't know if it was King or not, someone said injustice to one is injustice to all. And it's very important to have white folks involved in injustices regardless of whether it's in our Hispanic community or, or our black community. But until we put that on the level, until we acknowledge our, our fear, nervousness about talking, even talking, engaging in dialogue about the issue, it's, 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 it's going to make it more difficult to overcome some of these um, injustices, for sure. I think you're right about that. And, um, they, I think there was a precursor or an early version of what's become this cracking the code yes. thing that started yes. before I left. Conversation. I was in one session, which I thought was wonderful. And I guess it was slow getting started. And Roberta Waddle over here. She did. She's the yeah. ringleader. She so, usually is. She always is. Yeah. She yeah. usually is. It's great. You gotta just keep doing it. You just gotta keep doing it. And I don't, I don't have any magic formula, but um, think about working together. Um, I've seen figures, I don't know exactly how official they are, but I believe them, that vote suppression in North Carolina cut down on the votes of particularly people of color by at least 40 to 50,000 in the last election in 2014. And that was the margin in the U.S. Senate race. And when you've got voter suppression at the margins that has that kind of impact, and in Alabama it's even more, um, folks, they're rolling this back. Yeah. They're rolling this back. And they are I aiming. Agree. Notice, they aimed it at white people too, college students, mm -hmm. who are not all white, of course, but I mean, very largely, sure. you know. This is, this is not a new thing. And okay. that's one of the things that I, I really came home to me in studying the history of Alabama. They were quite explicit. They didn't want poor whites to vote. And they set up lots of barriers for that. Same thing. And um, they were very happy to have a very small electorate. Mm -hmm. And that, that idea is, is I, I'm, sure, I'm not sure it ever went away entirely. It is really bad. Yeah. And right. so there, there's more opportunity for whites to work together with people of color because they don't want us to vote either. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I want several things that you say. I thought about 2,000 when I was doing research for the um, Office of Juvenile Justice. And I was sent all the counties for North Carolina. And I went into their court system and I was looking at I one of the premises for several things we were looking at. But um, in fact, this was the year that um, the anniversary just came about in Columbine because a China County, they had the same version. Because um, I went to court with that little fellow. He was a little Caucasian with green hair, eight years old. And I was in court with him. And his mother came in. And she has a salary of 85000 plus. And she sat there and I asked for the parent to speak on behalf of the son. And her 15-year-old was already in the system in jail somewhere else. Um, I looked at this woman and I think, okay, I know what I'm making. Then $15,000 an hour. I thought I was making a little bit of money. It was making over $85,000. Uh, she's making annually. And she came to court with a little spiral notebook. And she stood there and battled about the things in her mansion home, all these cats, she could have been named Catwoman, that had nothing to do, and I realized that my second year of my master's, and that master's program, had nothing to do with why her son tried to do Columbine at, gosh, I think it's called Horton. It's right there in Chatham County on the right-hand side, um, the Horton School. And what, how we, they caught him is, he brags to the kids and they took his computer and they looked at 
hard drive and all that. But language is important. Communication is important. She didn't have an idea what was going on in her family. I kind of disagree with you, sir, when you talked about, she was talking about talking and communicating with folks, and you're talking about the language, and you thought it was, was small to talk about whether your fight is whether or not with semantics, because I really thought it was semantics, whether or not, I forgot what your comparison was, but something was macro and something was micro, and I have to disagree with you on another, I'm very intellectual, on a level, because if you take SAT one year, and they had it on different parts of the U.S., and one of the examples they were describing, where I grew up, I, the picture was an actual cup and saucer. I perceive that, excuse me, as a cup and saucer to somebody who grew up and they maybe have mugs or plastic, uh, whatever, and they might have a cup, but maybe the hand was broken. Never saw a saucer. They would not recognize that. So yes, their vocabulary is going to be different, and they're going to score, though, based on what they know and understand. If they've not been in an area where they have better schools, better teachers, better resources, they are not going to progress. But then you look at the teachers where they're in Alabama, I'm sorry, Atlanta or somewhere, they, um, they're getting ready to be, to spend a lot of time in jail because they were told, principal included, that you must get the scores up. So they did any means necessary. Now we know morally and legally what they did was wrong. But they did what they were told. So that's amazing. I kind of disagree with Ma'am over here because she talks about let's communicate. My generation says yes, folks communicated and where did we get? I'm finished with the talking. So those of you X plus years old get taught. If you don't act, folks like me I'm, see ya, I'm going. <coughs> I need action. And I can't wait 60 years for something to change. Because you've lost me. I am from the north. I'm proud of I'm fast moving. And if you're talking and quoting this and that, and yes, I did read a lot about Mahatma Gandhi, and I, I know his and a lot of other folks' theories. But if you can't put it in motion and get something moving quickly, you're losing myself and other folks. And talk is good, we do need to share ideas, but we need to put them in motion. And when the laws don't work, then we need to create new laws. And if somebody is steadfast on something from yesteryear and he won't change, he needs to be out of office. He's been in too long. And I do, though I don't, because what I'm getting ready to do, I can't actually attend more majority, but I am in the signed body. I'm in all the houses, and I'm very active. And I do other stuff too. And we do what we can in the community to be visible. And I'm doing stuff illegal because that is my field. But I am stuck with the laws that are in place right now. I do have to use those until we can do better. Well, I agree with you about that. And the only clarification I want to make here is if I say it might take a long time, that's not a recommendation. Oh, and that's just sort of an observation, and uh, I'd be very happy to see a big turnover in this state and in the South very soon myself. Uh, at the same time, how did they endure for 64 years in Dallas County, Alabama? That, that's a question that has come to be more of, of interest to me, that uh, how do we pass things down to the next generation? In fact. I mean, if, if I have any role yet left to play in the movement, it's telling these stories, passing them on, because they're worth them. They're important. They're meaningful. They can help people endure and get ready. They're, they're not blueprints that we just duplicate, um, but they are stories that can help people figure out what to do next time. I would like very much to thank Chuck. We had a very informal beginning to our evening, and I just want to remind everyone that Chuck was the director of Quaker House for 11 years, and during those 11 years, he brought a lot of public knowledge to the issues of torture, the domestic violence and sexual assault in the military, 
many issues that needed to be brought out to the public, and he helped a great deal with the healing as well as the public knowledge of those issues. So I'm so grateful to Chuck for coming back and telling us his story, and believe me, he has never stopped acting. Chuck talks a lot, but he never stops acting, and I'm very grateful that he came back to visit us tonight, and thank you all for coming.